when I send out my emails, every email I send out has my picture on it because I want to be humanized. I want people to know this guy who's connecting with me, this is what he looks like. He's a real human being. So I think that's the million dollar answer that organizations certainly use AI to help you generate content, but also make sure that you are humanizing yourself as much as possible because people want to do business with people that they know, that they like, and they trust, and that's the brand. Hey everyone, welcome back to the e-commerce traffic and conversion podcast. I'm Scott Branley and I'm here with my co-host DJ Sprague and our special guest today, Brian Ahern. Brian, how are you doing, my friend? I am doing wonderful. How are you guys today? So good. Great. Thank you. Brian, we're really excited to have you on the show. Uh, I have the great honor to introduce you. Uh, we've known each other for a little bit now, uh, back and forth with uh, social media and, and speaking, etc. But uh, for those that don't know Brian, Brian Ahern is the Chief Influence Officer at Influence People, a dynamic international keynote speaker, trainer, coach, and consultant. He is one of only 12 individuals in the world who currently holds the Cialdini Method Certified Trainer, or CMCT designation and one of only a handful of certified uh, trainers to lead the Moment Maker Workshop based on Cialdini's Persuasion book. Brian has authored three books on influence, including Influence People, which was named one of the top 100 influence books of all time by Book Authority. Uh, he has a TEDx talk on Persuasion and has been uh, seen by more than a million viewers. Wow, that's that's a lot. And by the way, I have the book. I've read the book, uh, Influence People. It's a great book. Highly recommend it. Uh, if you are at all in sales or anything to do with persuading or influencing or persuading people uh, to say yes to your offer or business, highly recommend Influence People by Brian Ahern. Well, thank you. So I appreciate the recommendation. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's jump right in, Brian. So what is a Cialdini Method Certified Trainer? A Cialdini Method Certified Trainer is somebody who's been personally trained by Dr. Cialdini and his partner, Dr. Gregory Neidert. And uh, that entailed, as I started adding it up in my mind, about 65 hours of commitment. So uh, I went through the two-day Principles of Persuasion workshop, um, applied, had to show that I had a marketing plan. And so they're very selective. That's why they keep it to about a dozen people. And when I was selected to go through then the process, we spent four days in Arizona with Dr. Cialdini and Dr. Neidert, where they went through every detail of the workshop. They uh, taught parts of it to us, why they do what they do. We had to actually do teachbacks. So that's kind of intimidating to uh, teach Dr. Cialdini your your uh, take on some of his principles. So we did a lot of teachbacks. There was a hundred question psychology test that we had to take. And even once we did all of that, you were still not certified because when you put on your first workshop, Dr. Neider would fly out. In my case, he came to Columbus, Ohio. And as I did the two day workshop, he sat in the back and took copious notes and every break would talk about what was going well, what could be done better. We would uh, debrief on things. And it was only once he gave the thumbs up to that final workshop that you actually became a CMCT. And there were some people who didn't get through the workshop. They didn't feel that they would handle the uh, information, Dr. Cialdini's life, life's work in a way that he would be satisfied with. So it was a, it was a very rigorous process. Wow. Sounds like a lot of weeding out. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, but again, Cialdini is so concerned with the presentation of his life's work. And if you go through the workshop and the things that you learn, the nuances make a big difference. People at a high level can think they understand this, but the, the nuances in terms of what you do, when you do it, how you do it can make a big difference. And, and that's what we're certified to help people understand. Yeah. Well, being one of 12 in the world is a, is a massive honor, obviously. So mm -hmm. congratulations on that. I mean, we, you, you certainly are a, a real guru. Um, so you also have a, a very extensive and very deep um, background in sales, mm -hmm. very successful in sales, insurance sales specifically. 
and also sales training. And tell us how your knowledge in behavioral science uh, has improved your ability to not only sell and persuade, but to teach others to be mm -hmm. very effective at sales. Sure. Well, I have to practice what I preach. So, you know, when I'm talking to salespeople and, and usually it's insurance agents, but I do a lot of work outside the industry, but that's my focus. I have to be modeling the behaviors that I'm encouraging them to do. Um, I love to teach people about this. I love to speak on stage. I love to do workshops. But to get the opportunity to do those, I have to practice what I preach. I have to sell myself and sell my services. So a big thing for me is um, utilizing authority and scarcity in that uh, having the authority and being personally trained by Cialdini. So that certainly uh, gives you authority, but it sets you apart in terms of scarcity, being one of only 12. But then uh, a lot of the CMCTs have very specific niches that they're in, and mine is selling, and then more specifically to insurance. And so I can I can tell whether it's large insurance agencies, companies, associations, you can't get what I do from anybody else because there's no other Cialdini trainers within the insurance industry. And there's very few that really have that deep focus on selling. And so that's how I put into practice uh, the methodologies that we teach. And that is usually a big hook for people to say, sounds like you can do something no one else can. We would like to hire you. So you're competing against no one. <laughs> Well, in a sense, though, I'm competing against every other sales trainer because it's very easy for people to think, well, sales training and and yes, that's a big umbrella. And that's where you have to begin to distinguish yourself. And so, uh, DJ, when you mentioned working with uh, car sales, right, cars, cars is a big umbrella, but there's a huge difference between a Ford and a BMW. They're not really competing for the same customers. And so you've got to be able to convey that. And so that's really what I have to do as somebody who is on the speaking circuit and trains is to sell the uniqueness of what I do. So yeah, we, we're talking about Cialdini, Dr. Cialdini, right? Who wrote the book, this book, Influence, The mm -hmm. Psychology of Persuasion, which is one of the best books <laughs> for, you know, in business, I think. Mm -hmm. So you you're steeped in into his principles how do you apply some of those principles to the sales industry well when i came across dr cialdini's material and it was a video of him presenting at stanford in the early 2000s i was already involved in sales training but immediately the light bulb came on and my first thought was this is the foundation of all selling i quickly understood the psychology that he was talking about explained why certain sales techniques and approaches worked and why certain ones didn't and i've never been a fan of teaching people techniques uh, because if you find yourself in a situation where the technique doesn't work you're dead in the water mm -hmm. But if you understand these principles, if you deeply understand them and you're constantly putting them into practice, well, now you can begin to pivot because still, whatever situation you're facing, psychology comes into play when you're trying to get to a yes. The other thing is in the sales cycle, uh, I, when I take a look at the sales cycle, I look at eight high level steps. You know, it starts with prospecting all the way through getting referrals. And if you get the referrals, the whole process starts again. There are specific principles that are more effective at different steps throughout the cycle. And so what I want to do is work with organizations to say, hey, you know, when you're prospecting, here's the principles you want to be focused on. But when you are successful there and you get your first meeting, here's what you need to be thinking about as you go into the meeting. What are the principles I really want to be able to, to bring to bear? Because Selling is about getting a yes at every step until somebody says yes at the close. But even there, you still want to get one more yes. And that is hopefully a happy customer is going to give you referrals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on from sales, what about business in general? How have you seen or applied the principles? I know you talk about some of this in your book, so you can share whichever mm -hmm. scenario you want. Um, maybe it's the sticky note example, but how do you apply these principles in overall business growth and success? Well, uh, the first thing I'll say, and then I'll talk about the stickiness. The first thing I would say is it's about relationship building. 
before a sale ever happens, for example, you know, LinkedIn being the biggest networking opportunity, people have to want to connect with you and, and they have to come to know, like, and trust you. And so these principles are at play, even when I'm not trying to uh, make a sale with somebody, I'm trying to build a relationship. If I do that well and there's a need, that may ultimately lead to me having an opportunity to work with that client. But even if there's not an opportunity, I still look at that as reps. Every time I do it, I get better at that skill. And then that skill, when there is somebody who's uh, really a prospective customer, then it begins to make everything so much easier. But it's not about selling there, but it is about business. It's about forming the connections, gaining the trust, et cetera. Um, what you mentioned about the sticky notes. So there's so many interesting things that Dr. Cialdini writes about, and yet people can read his books and still struggle to put into practice, daily practice, these principles. And that's where I think my strength lies, the application with my business knowledge and, and the knowledge of, of his work. And so one application that was talked about, an interesting study, was about the use of sticky notes. And as you say, DJ, I write about that in my book, that sticky notes can increase people's willingness to respond because it engages some reciprocity. Now, most people aren't thinking about this. Most people aren't thinking because somebody put a sticky note on something and personally signed it, I should respond. But studies show that they do. You know, when, when a handwritten letter is sent out with instructions, if you put a sticky note on it, it tends to go up. And if you personalize that sticky note, it goes up even more. So people find that interesting, but how do you put it into practice? Well, at the insurance company where I worked, uh, I came back from uh, an extended Christmas break one time and, and very quickly in early uh, January was called into a meeting with about half a dozen other people. And the situation that we faced was we had accidentally overpaid insurance agents in one of our operating states in the month of December. Somehow we accidentally doubled their commission. So it was a $700,000 mistake. And our, our team was tasked with getting that money back as quickly as possible because, oh, uh, by the end of January, early February, we're going to be paying bonuses. So it'd be nice to have an extra 700 grand in the bank. Well, as we strategize about doing this, and this goes back you know, many years, we couldn't just press a button and suck that money back out of the insurance agent's um, account or their bank. We were going to have to write a letter to all 150 agents and basically ask them to remit the overpayment. Now, we knew this wasn't going to be a high priority for them, right? You get a letter that says you've been overpaid $5,000, $8,000, $10,000. Please write a check as quickly as possible. <laughs> that doesn't move to the top of the priority list for the day. So I had done training with the accounting department the year before, and I specifically talked about the sticky notes. So I turned to the accounting manager, whose name is Steve, and I said, Steve, you remember the study I shared about the sticky notes? And he said, yeah. And I said, if you don't have time to put a sticky note on every one of those 150 letters, call me. I'll come do it. And he goes, no, I remember. I'll do it. So we construct the letter. They send it out. He personally puts a sticky note and signs every one of them. Weeks later, we're having lunch. And I said, how's the collection going? And guys, his exact words were, I'm floored. And I said, why? And he said, we've already gotten money back from 130 of the 150 agents. Wow. Now, the optimist in me, I said, you mean we didn't get it all back? And he did what you're doing. He laughed. He said, come on, man, we're talking about money. He goes, I fully expected most of them to say, it's your mistake. You fix it. Take it out of next month's commission. Put me on a payment plan. He goes, anything yeah. except pay us in full. Mm -hmm. So he was floored. Months later, when we had lunch again, I asked, how did, how did it end up? He said, we ended up getting money back in full from 147 of the 150. Wow. And so- um, you know, I mean, and, and here's a guy who's like totally rational, analytical accountant guy. He's dealing with money every day. He knows how hard it is to get people to pay or repay. So he was, he was blown away by it. That was all the verification that I needed from his experience, decades of experience in working with agents in collecting money. Um, 
that's just one example that I talk about in the book that you can take the psychology and put it into practice. And it doesn't just mean making a sale. It can be getting money uh, that's due you and getting it back quickly. Yeah. That personalization is, is huge. Well, and it's so easy to write a sticky note, right? You don't have to, yeah. you don't have to write a whole letter. You don't have to put a lot of thought into it. It can be like three or three to five words and your name at the bottom of it. Do you want to show them that example yeah. in the book yeah. that, that Brian sent you? Yeah. Jay? So this is, this is a sticky note in action. Mm -hmm. So what does it say? Right. Yep. It what says, you'll like this thing? story. You like yeah. the story. And I love how you kind of just like stuck it out of the book just slightly. So when he yeah. got it, he's like, oh, what's that? <laughs> That's Hope exactly why I did it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what's that little surprise? What's that little gem? Yeah. And, and, and uh, the intent, as I said, was that you'd see it, you'd turn to it, you'd find it compelling. And that once you read that story and went, wow, you're going to want to read the rest of the book. Exactly. Exactly. So one little thing you could add to that is a little smiley face for liking. Yeah. Right. Anyway. See, I, we can always learn. And, and, you know, it's interesting. You say the smiley face, I am actually redoing some of my logos and, and doing it to bring in some subtle smiles and things. So I'm working with somebody, she's given me a number of designs and I'm vetting them with, with people that I know and trust. And ultimately there will be the subtlety of that. Nice. There you go. The science, the science works. Yep. So um, how does Great. some of these uh, principles apply online? You know, if you take a look at my website, the first thing you're going to see is a picture of me. I want people to know here's a real live person and there's a personal message at the top. Uh, I make sure there's ample opportunity for people to connect with me. I think on my homepage, there's four different opportunities as you scroll through to set up a 15 minute call. And it works. I mean, I had a call ye yesterday. And I'll probably get a speaking engagement in March of 2025 because the guy went out and as soon as he saw it, it was I made it so easy for him to connect with me. But I also make sure there's testimonials, uh, a video testimonial. I got a great one at a conference many years ago, and it was just beautiful. So that's out there. So I'm applying those principles all throughout what I do when people land on the homepage. But even further than that, when it comes to, uh, for example, LinkedIn, again, it's the biggest online networking opportunity that we have. I'm very strategic about how I build my, my uh, followers and my connections. So for example, when I go to speak at a conference, I'm going to be in Bismarck, North Dakota on Tuesday and speak at a conference for an insurance company. I ask the organization, can I get the name and, and uh, agency that every person, every attendee works at? And then I diligently went through LinkedIn. And when I would find them, I send a personal note about, hey, I'm going to be speaking next week at the sales conference. I uh, thought it'd be great to connect beforehand, Brian. So it's a personalized invitation. Once they accept, I send a note back and I'll say, you know, Stan, thanks so much for connecting. If they respond to that, then we've got conversation. But I know that if they feel connected to me before I walk in the door, um, sometimes we'll send a video in advance of the conference too. If they then have seen and heard me, it's starting to generate some excitement. It's By the time I get on stage, it's not about like, well, who's this guy and why is he here? It's, oh, it's Brian. He reached out and connected with me. We actually had some back and forth. I saw his video and, and how he proposed to his wife using the psychology. That was really cool. And so it just builds this excitement for me as an individual when I'm, when I'm in the door there. So that's, that's you know, some examples of how I'm utilizing it beyond just what I do on my website. Good examples. Um, okay. So in your book, you talk about the fear of loss. Mm -hmm. Versus hope for gain, talking about influencing people. And could you talk a little bit more about why the fear of loss tends to be more powerful than the hope for gain? Yeah, there, there is a quote in Cialdini's book, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the, the uh, people who did an experiment said that over the course of history, having an abundance would be a good thing, but not having enough could be the difference between life and death. And they surmised that people who were more sensitive to loss did a better job surviving and passing along their genes. So in, in a sense, we're, we're kind of hardwired for loss. And it's interesting, we've never lived in a time of more abundance than we have now. And yet 
that fear of, of potential losing, that fear of missing out, FOMO, um, it, it makes a big difference when you incorporate it. Now, I always like to tell people I'm, I'm not a fan of fear mongering. I don't want it to be scare tactics, and I don't want people to come across as a Debbie or Danny Downer, but I want them to be able to honestly invoke a sense of loss, what somebody may miss out on. So an example would be when I was at the insurance company, I ran the bonus plan for more than a decade for the insurance agents. I also trained the field salespeople, those individuals who walked into independent insurance agents' offices. And most reps would probably walk into an office towards the end of the year and they might say, uh, Scott, I just looked at your sales numbers and you're so close to getting to president circle. So this next level. Mm. Um, and if you get there, you're going to earn an extra $50,000 on your bonus. Now that's going to motivate you. you. You probably weren't thinking about it. I just brought it into your radar. It's a lot of money. But what the research says is you would be far more motivated if I went out and had a conversation that said, Scott, I just took a look at the sales numbers and you're so close to getting to president circle, but if you miss it, you're going to lose $50,000 of your bonus. And you're probably going to say, what? And I would say, well, if you hit that metric, your bonus is going to be $150,000. But if you miss it by even a dollar, you're going to lose that $50,000 kicker. And I guarantee you're going to work a lot harder to avoid that. It almost feels like yours and somebody might take it away. Mm -hmm. And, and when you earn that bonus, you know, and you get that bonus check in late February, or early March, you're not going to say, darn you, Brian, for scaring me into getting that bonus. What am I going to do with it? You're going to say, thank you for honestly alerting me to what was on the line. I didn't realize that. That's how we just subtly bring this in to create a situation that's a win for you and that it would be a win for the company because you've written more profitable business, right? And the, the fact that we did that probably ups the odds that we'll continue to, to see those same behaviors. Yeah, that, that really makes sense because people took ownership of that bonus. Once you alerted them, you've got $50,000 basically coming to you guaranteed if you just do this one thing. Right. Yeah, because everybody cashed that check in their mind. Yeah. So now you get taken away from me. And you can bring the subtlety of of consistency, commitment and consistency and reinforce it. And I might say, Scott, and I, I know you don't want to lose that bonus, do you? Right. And once you tell me, no, I don't want to lose that bonus, right? You've taken a step to act consistently. When I leave that office, you're going to be thinking about what do I need to do? How can I fulfill this so that I don't lose that bonus? So now I'm bringing a couple of principles to bear that make it even more likely that you're going to take the actions that are going to be beneficial for you and that agency in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I so love true. psychology and uh, that's why I said influence is one of my favorite books of all time, just because there's so many ways that you can apply it to business. So, um, last question we always ask at the end of our podcast, it's the million dollar question. Um, does that mean I get paid a million dollars for answering? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, I mean, if your answer is good enough, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the pressure's on now. <laughs> um, so as an expert in your industry, um, and being a, an expert in influence, what would be one actionable strategy that a business owner could use to, you know, to use influence in their business? I think it would be humanizing themselves as much as possible. In the world that we live in, uh, obviously, technology over the course of our careers has ramped up, right? Once we got email, we started to realize email is my work. And then texting came in and people started lamenting the fact that, oh, uh, young people today, they can't talk. All they do is text. And um, and now we're in this age of AI where people are creating various content and, and putting it online. But I think other people still want to know they're dealing with humans. And there was a really fascinating study um, called the ASH studies. The ASH studies were conducted in the 1950s, and they had to do with um, conformity and social proof. And when they replicated these studies, um, and let me quickly say what the study did. If, if we were sitting in a room with six or eight people, and, and let's say DJ 
is the only one who's not in on it. In other words, the other seven people are part of the experiment and they're being shown lines and they're being asked, which is the longest line? Well, DJ sitting there and it's clear which is the longest line. And yet people are saying lines other than the longest line. So he's kind of scratching his head like, you know, are my eyes deceiving me? What's up with these people? And he's starting to get into a state of some uncertainty. A, a pretty large number of people don't go with what their senses are telling them and they conform to the group. Mm. And that conformity is in the sometimes in the 30 to 40 percent range. When they re when they replicated the study and they were using brain imaging, what they found was people really struggled with pain because they weren't part of the group. So even if they if they made a choice that, that they knew was the right choice, it still was painful. It was registering in the part of their brains that register pain. Interestingly, when they did the same experiment, but people were, were comparing themselves to a set of computers that were choosing a different line, they still felt some confusion, but they didn't feel pain. I share this because my thought is when when people know they're connecting with a real person, it's going to do something different to them because human beings are wired to be connected. That's how we have learned to survive over the millennia. And so I think there's an opportunity for, for businesses to really humanize themselves. And so it may be the picture. It may be the personal statement. It can be the video where you don't want to use stock photos and, and things like that. You want to use People who actually work at your organization, where people can see the name, oh, this is Carrie, and she's a, um, a customer service wrapper. This is Bob, he's a field salesperson. But where people can start to have a sense that even though it's a company and it's a website, I am really connecting with human beings on the other end. And, and that's one reason, like, when I send out my emails, every email I send out has my picture on it. Because I want to be humanized. I want people to know this guy who's connecting with me, this is what he looks like. He's a real human being. So I think that's the million dollar answer that organizations certainly use AI to help you generate content, but also make sure that you are humanizing yourself as much as possible because people want to do business with people that they know, that they like, and they trust. And that's the brand. Yeah. And that's going to even become more important as AI grows, right? That personalization, oh, that personal touch. We've, we've talked a lot about that in the, in the rating and review world, mm. because um, with AI, people can fake reviews very easily. And, and we think that a lot of these open review platforms are really going to struggle because people can take advantage of that. So mm -hmm. um, we've, we've had a lot of internal talks about how do we, how do we make sure that consumers know that our reviews are from a real person? Yeah. Cause that's going to make a you big know, difference in, in social media too. I I've had so many people who compliment the fact that I respond with a personal message. If anybody reaches out and connects with me, I will respond and I'll, and I'll say, um, thanks for reaching out, Scott, happy to connect. I'm curious. How did you find me? And when they come back and, oh, I took one of your courses on LinkedIn, or I did this, or I did that, and I respond back, they're like, wow, this is a real person. Some of the things that LinkedIn has done, I think, make it lazy. Like, you know, wishing somebody a happy birthday, and, and it just has the happy birthday, you know, and you can send that. And, and I get the sense, like, I don't feel like I have to respond to that because I know that there was no effort in it. There's no reciprocity that's being engaged. Mm. But when somebody types out a message like, hey, Brian and April Fools, it's your birthday. I hope you have a great day. I feel compelled to respond because I know they sat there and typed that message out. So uh, the technology can can be useful, but it can make us a little bit lazy and, and disengage a little of that uh, humanization and reciprocity. Yeah, that, that's really true. And it's funny you say that about LinkedIn because I always like to add either an emoji or two or like you say, a word or two that they know, oh, that's not just a standard right. uh, reply, but username or, or something mm -hmm. that makes it personal. Because like you say, and it's one of my favorite sayings, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. Yep. And uh, that likability, that smiley face, that friendliness, that approachability, mm -hmm. uh, that warmth, that humanization is super, super important. Yeah. Uh, and of course, being trustworthy. And well, then just getting... 
you know, on the humanization, it's a funny story. My wife always tells me I don't smile enough. And uh, so she bought me smiling lessons for my birthday one year. <laughs> didn't didn't work real great. But um, I will say that, um, you know, you guys were at the Influence Amplified Conference. And when I got up and talked about Cialdini's impact on my life, and I, I may even get a little choked up now, um, I never had a talk where more people came up and and just thanked me because that human part came forth. I mean, they knew that what was going to follow was true mm -hmm. because I got so emotional ab about that, or I got emotional when I talked about the people that I coached and the impact that I was able to have on them. That's that's humanization in, in a different way. It wasn't online, but but being comfortable to allow those emotions come up, to take a breath and 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 let it move on. But I could sense from the stage, it got quiet and everybody got locked in at that point. It wasn't a ploy or anything because like I said, just moments ago, as I just tried to talk about it, I still get emotional. That's the human. They want to connect with a human being. So true, which is why AI will always be challenged mm -hmm. to create that emotional, real humanistic uh, genuineness that... Yeah. Uh, that people love, they crave, especially in the tech era. People yeah. really, really crave that human connection, that humanness, which is why I think live events will never completely go away. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to wrap up. Um, the best way to reach you, Brian, is uh, Brian Ahern at influencepeople.biz, correct? Yep. Uh, we'll also share his contact information and his social media links uh, in the show notes. So you can reach out uh, and connect with Brian. You're very active on LinkedIn. Yep. And uh, like you say, you do respond. I will. And if somebody reaches out I'm, and they don't put a message, I'm going to say, how did you find me? And, and uh, th so they're going to they're gonna hear from me. And if they do put a message, they're still going to hear from me. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your time and, and uh, taking uh, time out of your life to be on this show and share your thoughts and experiences. And we thank all of our listeners for coming. And don't forget to uh, get your free copy of Reputation King at reputationking.com. Uh, you can download that uh, audio and uh, digital version of the book. And we look forward to seeing you on our next episode. Thanks, Brian.